Revelation chapter 20 speaks of a period of 1,000 years when Christ would reign. Now, through church history, there have been a number of different interpretations of this. So here I'm just wanting to very briefly summarize some of these different approaches, mostly so you don't feel compelled to accept a certain approach just because everybody you know holds that approach, but rather you can see that through history a lot of people have held a lot of different approaches. So just go to Revelation 20 and figure out what it says based on what's there. So in the second century, early church fathers such as Papias in the very early second century, Justin Martyr in the mid-second century, and Irenaeus in the late second century, all agreed that there would be a future period of a thousand years when Christ would reign on earth. As far as a period of great tribulation, they believed they were either in it or about to go through it, but they believed that there would be a future thousand years. Now, Justin Martyr in the mid-second century admits that not everybody held that view, but it still seems to have been the dominant view in the second century. However, once Constantine became emperor, the dominant view shifted, or it had shifted by that time. Eusebius, who was a, a real political devotee of Constantine, said that unlike other heretics, premillennialists could be talked out of their heresy. He was really dogmatic against premillennialism. And eventually, a, a more well-thought-out amillennial view arose, especially articulated by Augustine and actually held by most people in the Middle Ages, not all of them, and by Luther and Calvin and many of the Reformers. And that was the understanding that in Revelation 20, when it speaks of Christ reigning, it's the other side of the tribulation that you see in the book of Revelation. That is, that yes, God's people are being persecuted, but the other side of that is that we're overcoming in the midst of our suffering, and therefore we're, we're reigning with Christ on earth. The premillennial critique of that would be that that's not quite what Revelation 20 seems to describe, because Revelation 20 speaks of uh, the saints who have already been beheaded reigning with Christ. And it speaks of the first resurrection, but then at the end, you have the, the unrighteous dead who are resurrected, and that's the second death. The amillennial counter to the premillennial counter of the amillennial position is that you don't have a future thousand years anywhere else in the New Testament. Everything seems to happen when Christ's re Christ returns. There's no stages. There's no phases there. The premillennial response to that is that God often unfolds things in stages and phases, and you don't see them until almost the time when you get there, like when Jesus is announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was already manifested in his ministry, but the consummation remained future. And then we have the, the post-millennial view, which arose, well, actually, it was it was very common in the Great Awakenings. So um, Wesley may have held it, different passages may suggest different things, but um, uh, certainly uh, a number a number of the, the people did, uh, Jonathan Edwards did, uh, very influential in the first Great Awakening in the United States. Charles Finney led maybe half a million people to Christ in the second Great Awakening in the United States, uh, over a period of decades, the post-millennial view was the dominant view. Well, what's the post-millennial view? That's the view that we will establish God's kingdom on earth. So remember passages like, the good news must be preached among all the nations, or the command to make disciples of the nations. So the view is that we set things up and Christ will return in glory afterwards. We crown them with many crowns, to use the language of a song that comes from that a period of post-millennial dominance. It coincided, not probably coincidentally, with you know, the British Empire and colonialism 
in the U.S. Manifest Destiny. It was very, very highly uh, respected and and held by many people at that time. Although many of the many of the uh, scholars didn't hold that. So, like the Princeton, uh, many of the many of the scholars there actually were amillennial. So, uh, but people saw that a lot of the destiny they were hoping for about things just getting better and better didn't actually materialize. So World War I, uh, that was kind of the, the death of 19th century liberalism because people saw, oh boy, humanity can be wicked sometimes. Uh, at the same time, it also drew a lot of people out of post-millennialism and a form of premillennialism became dominant on a popular level. Former premillennialism I'm talking about here is dispensational premillennialism, which seems to have its origin about 1830, it, it, certainly in the form in which it dominated in the 1800s, started in 1830, where uh, there was not just a future millennium, but a future tribulation. A lot of people already believed in that, but a future tribulation of um, seven years. And in the original dispensational schema, which is not held by all dispensationalists today, but the original dispensational schema was God won't deal with the church and with Israel at the same time, so he will take the church out, the rapture of the church out, before the Great Tribulation. And so the tribulation and the millennium were especially for God to work with the Jewish people. Now, um, many amillennialists would say that God that the church is spiritual Israel. Now, that is not necessarily, well, actually, the Bible does speak of the church, you know, speaks of believers in Jesus being grafted into the heritage of Israel, um, speaks of us as being children of Abraham. So, I mean, the, the idea of spiritual Israel is understandable. But if you believe that there are phases, you can say, yes, Christians have been grafted in, but God still has a plan for the Jewish people. And so um, this is not actually inherent in the interpretation of Revelation 20 itself. In other words, you could be theoretically amillennial and still believe in a restoration of the Jewish people, um, or Jewish people turning to God based on Re Romans chapter 11. But many amillennialists don't expect that. Most premillennialists do. Among premillennialists, there are, again, two versions. What we have in the early church fathers and among a number of premillennialists to, today is what we call the historic premillennial view. The tribulation is either the present age or its future, but the church doesn't get out of it. There's only one second coming. It all happens at the second coming. The rapture, so to speak, when believers are caught up in the air to meet Jesus, it's on his way down. And the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and of his Messiah. The dispensational premillennial view is that Jesus comes not just before the thousand years, but he also comes before the great tribulation. Now, the amillennial view of the tribulation normally, I'm not saying it has to be this, but the amillennial view of the tribulation is normally that uh, the present age is the tribulation, which some historic premillennialists believe, and that it's also the millennium, which historic premillennialists obviously don't believe. Um, and then, of course, postmillennialists, there could be a tribulation, perhaps, but you know, our our work is to set up God's kingdom on earth. Um, I can tell you what my view is, but it won't make any difference. The big thing is to look at the text and see what it says. I think. Well, this is what I'll say. I think on its own terms, taken by itself, Revelation 20 looks premillennial because of the, the way the text is structured. However, the rest of the New Testament doesn't talk about it. And so if we didn't have Revelation 20, we'd probably all be all millennium, or well, at least we wouldn't believe in a future millennium, which isn't quite the, the dominant current amillennial view. Uh, so take it from there the rest of the way.